Hey guys, how's it going? I'm going to take a crack at doing a run through on 1st John chapter 3. And so, uh, just trying to get around to these whenever I can. And, uh, you know, I get exhausted and work and all that stuff. And then, you know, it's something that's, you know, kind of short and simple, but at the same time, you know, it, it does take a lot out of me, I guess. The last one kind of did. It ended up going 30 minutes. Who knows how long this will go. But uh, I guess we'll just get into it. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth, knoweth us not, because it knew him not. And so I was thinking, um, well, it basically says that, you know, this is how much God loves us, that we are called his sons, okay, by adoption. Okay, not a son in the same sense that we share the same nature as the Father, you know, that we are deity, like Jesus is the son, but we are the adopted sons. And um, so there's a lot involved in that and the sonship and our adopted sonship and everything. And, you know, that's a lot of stuff that I need to look into in, in a study in itself. But that's one way that we know uh, that God loves us, that we are called his sons. And... Uh, I was thinking there's a lot of relationship with us and Jesus. Uh, you know, Jesus is our example. But, you know, it says, Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. And, uh, well, it speaks of the Father, I guess. So, either way, uh, our relationship with God or Jesus, you know, the Father or the Son, either way, uh, you know, we're supposed to forgive as Jesus forgave us. And, um, you know, love as God loved us. And, you know, it says the world will hate us. If the, or if the world hates us, it's because they hated, you know, Jesus first. And so there's just this relationship that we share uh, where we go through the similar, similar things and where to live in a similar manner. Anyways, the next verse, beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it says... You know, now we are the sons of God. So he was saying, you know, they currently possess that title as being adopted son of God. And so, uh, you know, there's a thing when we're talking about salvation um, that you can be certain, you know, that you're already saved. You're, if you've believed in Jesus Christ, then you already are a son of God. You already possess that. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but what? But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So, uh, you know, when we go to see the Lord, you know, we will have transformed bodies, we'll have a glorified body, spiritual body, like Paul has said. And, uh, you know, we will be as Jesus, um, as far as, you know, being completely free from sin and um, just completely, completely renewed. Um, so that's a great hope that we have. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. And so, again, the hope's not really, this in the sense is not, you know, I hope that this is going to happen, but it might not. It's more of a certainty. This is a hope that we have. Um, it's something that is certain for the future for believers. And uh, every man that hath this hope in him, so every man who you know is born again, who is an adopted son of God, purifieth himself even as he is pure. And so there is the thing of sanctification in which, you know, the Lord leads us through sanctification, but we have to take steps to purify ourselves as well. We have to crucify, you know, the old man. And um, so, you know, there's a lot of the easy believism people that, uh, you know, they try to say that there's no change life and that. And, but here, First John chapter 3, verse 3, it says, Every man that hath this hope, every man that is born again, purifieth himself. And so there's no doubt 
that uh, a Christian is to be, you know, a renewed person and uh, to live as the Lord lived, you know, pure and holy and walk righteously. And, uh, you know, it's it's a process and there's, uh, you know, different levels of sanctification and, and it's always, you know, daily asking for forgiveness. But, you know, there is, you know, a strive towards holiness, absolutely. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth, transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So, uh, sin's a transgression of the law. Uh, this is pretty straightforward here. Um, and uh, so he, he says, you know, every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. And then he talks about sin. Committing sin is transgressing the law. And then in verse 5, And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. And so, in verse 3, he said he is pure. In verse 5, he says, and in him is no sin. And um, so, Jesus was manifested to take away our sins. Um, you know, that talks about, about salvation, justification, and um, how, you know, our sins are forgiven. And... Uh, So, he continues in verse 6, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither know him, known him. And again, this is a lot of sinless perfection. So I think sinless perfection, people probably really love First John. They're going to quote a lot of this stuff because they take it out of context. But, you know, it's another one of those controversial verses. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. And so people take this different ways. Either, you know, the sinless perfection people will say that you need to live a sinless life to stay saved. And then if you commit sin, then you can lose your salvation. So you need to live perfectly holy. And they say this can be accomplished. You can live a perfect sinless life. And, you know, and if you don't, then you lose your salvation. There's the, the, those consequences. Um, or there's... You know, the easy believism people, too, might say, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. And they'll say, well, in God's eyes, you know, all of your sins are forgiven. So no matter, you know, what sinful lifestyle you live or no matter whatever you do, you know, God doesn't see any of it and none of it's counted or, you know, none of it's counted against you or whatever. And then um, you are forgiven of all your sins. But, but then it says, you know, Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. And so, you know, what is the context? Is it specific sins it's talking about? Is it talking about, you know, one sin? But I think that the context is probably like, you know, a lifestyle of sin here. Uh, we know that he was manifested to take away our sins. Because, you know, it's talking about, it goes back to verse 3, that, you know, born again people will purify themselves. There's the sanctification. There's the striving towards being as God was. And, um... So, there's just, there's kind of that contrast of, you know, are you striving towards holiness, or are you striving towards sin? Um, so I think it's more of a continual thing. Uh, but let's continue. Verse 7, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Uh, and so that phrase, let no man deceive you, that's interesting. I think it's used more than once in scripture, um, maybe even by Jesus, I don't remember exactly if he actually says those exact words, we see the little children again, you know, you, I would think that he's speaking of, you know, his spiritual children, people that have been led to the Lord, he that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous, so, you know, so basically, you know, believers purify themselves even as the Lord is pure. Believers are righteous even as he is righteous. Um, you know, it talks about, you know, believers not sinning because Jesus had no sin in him. Um, 
but again, I don't think that it's to the same extent. You know, we're not as as righteous as the Lord is, or as pure as the Lord is, but we're striving towards that. Uh, and so we're not sinless like the Lord is. But let's see, First John three eight: He that committeth sin is of the devil. The devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. So, um, you know, we, we have this idea of the children of the devil, for the devil sent from the beginning. For the purpose of the Son of God was that he might destroy the works of the devil. And so, uh, basically, you know, he's freed us from the bondage of sin. And that's what it talks about in Peter, one of the epistles of Peter, I think, and it talks about um, how Jesus has led captivity captive. And I've talked about how people try to use that for this foolish Abraham's, doc Abraham's bosom doctrine. No, what it means is that, you know, he took death and sin and bondage and, and you know, he, uh, he took that captive. You know, he destroyed the works of the devil. And so, uh, believers in Christ are no longer under the bondage of sin. They're no longer, um, you know, they're, we're free from sin. Um, in the sense that, you know, yes, we're justified and we're forgiven, but also that we're free from the power of sin. You know, it doesn't have the power over our lives as it did when we were, when we were unbelievers. Okay, our eyes are opened. We see, um, you know, right and wrong, and we have, you know, uh, God's word to live by, and, you know, we are uh, indwelt with the Holy Spirit, and it guides us. And so, uh, so yeah. So Jesus did destroy the works of the devil. You know, he overcame the world, you know, uh, through his death on the cross. And uh, those of us who are believers in him, we have, uh, you know, we're able to relinquish that, what he has done for us. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Uh, he's basically just repeating himself in verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. For his sin remaineth in him. His, his seed remaineth in him. I don't read that right. For his seed remaineth in him. Okay. Uh, being born again. And, uh, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. And, you know, I'm kind of wondering if the seed thing kind of has to do with, you know, it makes me think of the parable of the sower. Kind of, and I don't think that I usually thought about that when I read that, but I'm kind of thinking about that now. Um, but, you know, either way, you know, he cannot sin because he is born of God. That's another, I'm going to drink some coffee, it's early in the morning. I need some energy here to get my mind going. This kind of makes me think of Calvinism, and I don't, you know, he cannot sin um, because he is born of God. Um, so, you know, people can definitely take that out of context either way. And, um, so... And, I mean, it's even hard for me to interpret and think of exactly, but, you know, I kind of want to think that it's saying, uh, basically, that when Christians do sin, and we do, and we uh, recognize it, you know, and we're not okay with it, and uh, so, you know, we're not living in sin under the power of sin like we were when we were lost, and there's a change there, and... Uh, it's basically, you know, we're, we're convicted of it, or, you know, we're not okay with it. So, so I'd like to see a lot of different commentators' opinions on these, and uh, continue on to the last verse of the section. 
In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. And again, he talks about loving your brother, which he hit on a lot, you know, in the previous uh, parts. Actually, I guess this is continuing from verse 2, the section, according to the Esword, the way it looks at it, it's like it's continuing. So it'd be the children of God from verse 28 into... 1 John 3 down to verse 10. Um, and, you know, and that's what a lot of it, you know, maybe that's the context of a lot of it, too, where he's saying, you know, that believers cannot sin, and, you know, whoever sinneth is of the devil. And, you know, at the very end of this, he talks about loving your brother. Maybe that's kind of what he's talking about. He's talking about hatreds, to hatred towards others. You know, maybe that's the big focus of this. And, um, you know, maybe that's kind of the main idea, is that, uh, you know, people that are filled with hate and stuff, um, love one another, verses 11 through 24, so this is the second section of this chapter, First John chapter 3, verse 11, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that ye should love one another. Again, from the beginning, I guess, in this sense, is uh, since the gospel was told to them or so, we should love one another, absolutely. It's stated emphatically, right, in scripture over and over and over again. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, who slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him. Then here's talking about, uh, you know, like a biological brother, but um, at the time, I guess, they were like the only family on the earth. Because his own works were evil, and his brother is righteous. And wherefore he slew him. Why? Because his works were evil, and his brothers were righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that ye have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. And he that loveth not his brother abideth in death. It seems like you're just repeating over and over and over again. And this does have a lot to do with love and hate. You know, there's a big contrast there, and there's light and there's dark. Uh, so maybe that is one of the main focuses in here. You know, he's talking about how do we know if somebody's born of Christ or not? You know, do they hate their brother, okay, or do they have love for the brethren? It seems like those are kind of the major determining factors here. Um... We know that we've passed, we have passed from death unto life. We are sons. These are things where he's saying, you know, we currently possess already as believers. These are already, you know, in the bag for us, sealed and, and completed, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in him. And, uh... You know, I can see people taking this out of context, and, you know, if you can follow me, you know, it says, we know that we have passed from death unto life. Why? Because we love the brethren. So people could say, like, that implies, like, some kind of work salvation, like, you must love the brethren in order to be saved. But, no, he's just saying that, uh, you know, it's your faith that saves you, but your love for the brethren is a manifestation of your faith. You know, it's a proof of your faith. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Okay. So we who are believers have passed from death unto life. But those who are not believers abide in death. And we're not talking about a physical death here because everybody has to die. In Hebrews it says, you know, it is... Every man dies once, and then the judgment. We're talking about spiritual death. And uh, he speaks about that a lot, and I think that comes into play later on, and I've talked about it, and I think it's in chapter 5, maybe, I'm not sure, but it talks about um, the sin unto death, and that I think that the, uh, the death has to be spiritual in that sense. And there's a lot of controversy over that, too, but I'll cover that when I get around to that again. But you'll notice that when he says death a lot, and here, when he talks about life and death, that's usually in a spiritual context. Um, he uses the example of uh, Cain and Abel, 
and uh, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. And uh, so we see the things kind of with uh, Jesus spoke of how, you know, if a man looks upon another woman with lust, he's committed adultery. And, uh, you know, that could be looking upon another man's wife or it could be just looking upon any woman. But either way, the idea is that, you know, sin starts from the heart. It starts, you know, internally and, you know, it manifests into these things. And so... If you have, you know, a deep-rooted hatred towards somebody, then, you know, you're basically, you know, it, it doesn't mean, you know, you're not, you're not a murderer, but in a sense you are because, uh, you know, you're guilty of, you know, the sin that, you know, that, that drives that. Um, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Uh. So, you know, it has to do with hatred. And, uh, you know, we do know that Moses did murder somebody, right? He murdered, like, a, a guard or something and buried him. And basically, Paul was responsible for the death of a lot of people, whether he directly did anything or not. But, I mean, he kind of led the charge there. And uh, he, he converted, but... Um, and, you know, I don't know whether I'd say whether Moses was already saved or not before what happened with him, but murderers, you know, people who have done that can repent. But, uh, you know, this is not becoming of, you know, the life of a Christian to hate other people like that. And, uh... You know, we see eternal life mentioned. Uh, you know, he just talked about how, you know, passed from death unto life, and now he's talking about eternal life. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our life, our lives for the brethren. And so we see a, a self-sacrificial, you know, way of life. And here again, you know, he says, how can we know that God loves us? Because he laid down his life for us. And earlier he said, how can we know that God loves us? Because he's called us his son. So he's given us these ex great examples of God's love for us. And he um, also, again, like I said, there's that kind of connection. Uh, he, he, he said, uh, you know, what did he say basically? The world knoweth us not, because it knoweth him not, you know. And then here it says, uh, we should, uh, um, you know, sacrifice ourselves for others, as, you know, Jesus sacrificed himself for us. Uh, we ought to lay down our lives. So there's, again, there's that comparison, there's that relationship that we have. Uh, a similar, you know, way that we are to live. But whoso hath this world's good, and seen his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Okay, so there's, he's going into a little bit deeper, maybe, of kind of what he's speaking of. Whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? This kind of makes me think of James, too, where it says, uh, you know, talks about your, your faith and your works. And, you know, if you see somebody who, you know, needs clothing and needs food and, you know, you basically say God bless or whatever and, you know, shut them out and you don't help them when you're, you know, perfectly able to or whatever, you know, they're seeking your help or whatever and you're not doing it. Um you know, how does, you know, your faith or, you know, your works show that, you know, you don't have faith. It's kind of the same idea. Uh, I 
And so when he says, you know, we should lay down our lives for the brethren, you know, that could be, you know, an actual death, like Jesus did for us, you know, if there's persecution or whatever. But also, you know, just caring for, praying, and, and helping others that are in need. Um, and so that could be kind of the hatred that he's talking about, too. It might not just be a hatred to where, you know, uh, I wish this person was dead or whatever. But also a hatred kind of in the sense of, you know, neglecting people and uh, shutting them out and, you know, being selfish, uh, very self-centered. Um, so how dwelleth the love of God in him? You know, I'm just going to go on to the next verse. 18, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Sincerely and honestly from the heart. Uh, I don't say one thing to somebody and, you know, and do another. Hereby we know that we are of the truth we sh and shall assure our hearts before him. So those who are of the truth shall assure their hearts before him. And, you know, previously he talked about, you know, let us not be ashamed before him. So you're either assured or, you know, you're either in light or you're in the dark. You're either assured or ashamed. Shall assure our hearts before him. And that's interesting language, the figurative language. He talks about our hearts before him. We shall assure our hearts. For if our heart condemn us, okay, he continues on with this idea here. If our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. So, we're obviously not talking about you know, the physical heart that pumps blood or whatever. It's figurative. Talking about, um, you know, kind of our conscience, in a sense, uh, the uh, immaterial part of man. You know, there's two parts. Like I said, there's the body, there's the immaterial, and we're talking more of the immaterial, the heart, uh, the soul, the spirit, the mind, etc. These words are used to describe that. And um, so it's basically kind of our conscience, uh, you know, if you have a guilty conscience and, uh, you know, God knows our heart and, and he's talking about, you know, again, if a brother needs help or whatever, okay, and you say, yeah, you know, you, you say, yeah, I love the brethren or whatever, but you ought, you purposely, you know, shut brethren out from helping them when they are in great need or whatever. And, you know, you're saying one thing and you're doing another. You know, a fake believer, a person who is, you know, like a facade and uh, their heart's truly not right with God. Well, God can see through that, you know. God can see through their facade. So... You know, you're not fooling anybody. It's basically what he's saying. You know, you're not fooling God. Uh, you know. So, uh, what you need to do is, you know, make sure that you are right with God. Because, in the end, you know, he's your judge. And uh, he sees and knows everything. And uh, it's doing you no good, really, by uh, being a pretender. So, whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments, and do these things that are pleasing in his sight. Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments. <coughs> and that, you know, kind of has to do with prayer, I think, too, in, in a sense. You know, whatsoever we ask. And, uh, you know, Jesus talked about well, whatever you ask, you know, pray it in my name and it'll be given unto you. 
And, you know, it doesn't mean if I ask God for a Ferrari for tomorrow or whatever that, you know, I get that. Not even that I would want that. But, you know, I'm just trying to get something ridiculous. But, uh, you know, but we should be praying, you know, for whatever, you know, whatever spiritual needs we want or, you know, even physical things. But, uh, you know, we just, we need to remember prayer. And, you know, that's something that I, uh, have issues with, and I'm sure that everybody does. We forget how great prayer is and how much we need prayer. And prayer is for us, you know, to get us right. Uh, but, you know, God does hear our prayers, and God does answer prayers. And so, uh, we just, we need to be praying more. And uh, keep His commandments. And, you know, there, again, that could be abused as a sinless perfection thing. But, again, also, you look at the whole context, and it's talking about love and hate, okay? And Jesus said, you know, the greatest commandments, love God, love your neighbor, right? And so, um, I think, he, again, I think he's kind of talking about being loving, do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, uh, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. So basically he goes on there just to say what I said, that, you know, that's the commandments to believe on Jesus and love one another. Uh, you know, that's the simplest form of it. And, uh, and I didn't really, I was just thinking about in 1 John chapter 3, verse 20, it says God knows all things, and that's talking about, you know, the omniscience of God. And uh, there's some that people that people that even deny that that God doesn't know the future, you know. If they say if God knows everything, then everything's set. And you know, they try to oppose Calvinism, which is good, but then they go to another extreme, to where you know the open theology. Uh, they say that you know, God doesn't know everything, and he kind of changes on a dime or whatever. <laughs> it's absurd, but I mean that just directly refutes that. And, of course, people can say there's different interpretations or whatever, but there's lots of other verses that would refute that kind of idea. God, you know, is far above us, and obviously he does know all things, and he sees all things. And uh, so love one another, believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. And I was talking to a brother about this, too, how even, I'll just say this, Robert Breaker commented on one of my parody videos of him, the blubber flaker thing, and uh, he said, well, you forgot the gospel message, and, you know, I didn't forget anything, I did what I wanted to, but, so he quotes, I think he quotes First Corinthians or something, I could be wrong, but, you know, there's that verse in Corinthians where it says, you know, this is the gospel that Jesus died for your sins and rose again from the, you know, on the third day, and there's people that just, they go to that, like, they think that's the only time the gospel's mentioned in the scripture, or, you know, it has to be, like, within that box, and it's just ridiculous, you know, it's mentioned all over Scripture, like here in First John 3.23, you know, believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ. Um, you know, basically, and you know, and it talks about Jesus dying uh, and stuff, too, uh, for us. You know, He laid down His life for us and all that. But anyways, it, it, just, it just baffles me when people just go to that verse, like, that's all there is, and, uh, I don't know, it's kind of the weird, rigid people that go to weird extremes by trying to, you know, honor scripture and being, you know, too rigid with it, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, verse 24, and he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him, and hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. Okay. Uh, so, you know, there's the thing of us dwelling in him and him dwelling in us. So we have a close personal relationship, basically. And, um, I don't know. He, he's just, he repeats himself a lot, emphasizes a lot on these points. But, uh, you know, who do, how do we know who's in the light and who's in the dark, you know? He that loves his brother is in the light. Uh, you know, he that keeps the commandments is of God. And basically, so he kind of 
emphasizes, uses different words and phrases to kind of say the same thing. But, you know, it kind of, but it adds layers on it and it gives us more details and it uh, gives us more depth to what he's saying. Uh, you know, not only are we to love the brethren because Jesus loved us, but also because he commanded us to love them. And so, you know, there's more depth to it. But there's a lot of interesting stuff here. I'm actually really liking going through this, but there is a lot of controversy and a lot of things that could be broken down pretty deep in this. But uh, that's it. Another 30-minute video, 35 minutes here. So thanks for watching, guys. Hope you learned something, and I'd like to know what you think about this. And Again, this is just me running through, giving you some ideas of what I've learned from studying before. And... Uh, you know, it's not the end-all, be-all, certainly, and I want to go over commentaries, do a more in-depth, expository-type study, and, and uh, learn a lot more from this. So thanks for watching. God bless.